Good morning. Thank you for joining me here today. I want to give a special welcome and a thank you to North Dakota Governor Doug Burgum, who is uh, joining me virtually today, and you can see on that screen if you're looking at it. This land was shared by residents of uh, Manitoba, North Dakota, long before they were even known as Manitoba, North Dakota. Do you have contact to talk to yeah. Before our nations were even established. And I would like to uh, acknowledge today that we are on Treaty 1 land. This is the traditional territories of uh, the Anishinaabeg, the Cree, the OG Cree, the Dakota, and the Dene peoples. And we're also on the homeland of the Métis Nation as well. Before there were borders here, long before there were borders here, there were people here, people who cooperated in challenging times. And we are in such challenging times now as we all know. Today's announcement is indicative of the friendly relationship between Manitoba and North Dakota that has always benefited our people on both sides of that border. It's benefited our communities, it's benefited our economies, it continues to this day and it will be strengthened as time goes by. And Manitoba and North Dakota are to me, and I believe to Governor Burgum as well, the best examples of that greater international cooperation that Canada and Manitoba Canada and the United States, Manitoba and North Dakota have shared throughout our strengthening relationship together. Today is a small victory over some of the challenges that we face in dealing with the largest health and, and economic pandemic in, uh, in our time. And today is an important victory also for healthcare cooperation. And it's illustrative of the progress we can achieve when we work together in good times and in bad. The U.S. and Canada do not so much compete against one another as much as we build things together. And today, along with North Dakota and that smiling governor, we are building hope for people together. North Dakota and Manitoba share the fifth most active border crossing that exists between Canada and the United States. More than a million vehicles per year cross our shared borders, but not in the last year. And so getting back to that maintaining of that safe and efficient flow of goods and services across the Canada and the United States border is important and protecting the health and well-being, the health and safety of all of us and of those who transport those goods is essential for both our communities and our economies as well. The reality of COVID in Canada today is such that the variants of concern are here, the third wave is here, but the vaccines are not here yet. We have months ahead of us before uh, all Canadians are fully vaccinated, and that's in stark contrast to our American neighbours. Our number one limiting factor in protecting Manitobans from this deadly virus is the availability of COVID-19 vaccines. And so today, it gives me great pleasure to announce a continental first, a joint initiative between Manitoba and North Dakota to vaccinate Manitoba-based essential workers that are transporting goods to and from the United States. The Essential Workers Cross-Border Vaccination Initiative is going to begin with truck drivers who regularly cross the Canada-US border. These hard-working Manitobans keep our economies moving, they keep our people fed, and they keep us all supplied with the goods and the, and the, that we need and that we rely upon. Beginning tomorrow, the state of North Dakota will provide COVID-19 vaccines to fully immunize Manitoba-based truck drivers during their uh, routine trips to the United States and over the next six to eight weeks conclude with the second vaccine and they will be doing that thanks to the government of the United States of America free of charge. And we say thank you. Working with the Manitoba Trucking Association, Manitoba and North Dakota will identify and coordinate with eligible individuals to schedule vaccination appointments. It is estimated that as many as 4,000 Manitoba drivers will be taking part in this program. And I am confident that this initiative will be successful and we do hope to expand this program to meet other vaccination needs for Manitobans in the future as well. And Governor Brigham and I have already spoken about that as recently as this morning. Additionally, we are creating a model when we announce this today of Canada-US cooperation that I hope sincerely that other, others across our countries will emulate. I have written to our Prime Minister 
I have written to our provincial and territorial colleagues as well uh, to inform them of this initiative. I hope that this will lay the groundwork for others, for an eventual safe reopening of our shared border, for travel to return, uh, for tourism, mutual, mutual tourism to be developed again. There isn't a Manitoban, I don't believe, who doesn't look forward to the day when they can enjoy a little trip down to Grand Forks or Fargo, and I know that the Chambers of Commerce of those two communities will welcome that reopening when it is safe to do so. I want to say thanks again, a personal thanks to a man I have great respect and admiration for, Governor Burgum, and to welcome him to say a few words now. Doug, over to you. Thank you, Premier Palliser, uh, and good morning to everyone there in Winnipeg and all of your citizens across Manitoba and across North Dakota. Uh, it's really uh, fantastic that we're able to uh, sign this historic agreement uh, during these incredibly challenging times. But I want to just say uh, right at the beginning, share my gratitude with uh, Brian. Uh, and credit to him goes this idea. He called me a few weeks ago. Uh, he and I have always uh, been, been close. Uh, we both were moved into uh, leadership positions in 2016. Uh, <clears throat> we've gotten to know each other. Uh, my kids have had a chance to be in his office. Uh, I know that uh, like, like many Manitobans, he spent time uh, down in uh, North Dakota and a lot of North Dakotans enjoy coming to Winnipeg. I think we're all anxious to get, uh, get back together again. <clears throat> but we've always uh, in our relationship, which I, what's come where we get to know each other on a first name basis, we've been always looking for opportunities uh, to collaborate because we know that uh, just like in the communities that he and I both grew up with in small rural communities, it was always about neighbors helping neighbors. And this is the way that both of us come to our, to do our jobs today. It's the way we do business in Manitoba. It's the way we do business in North Dakota. And so, uh, but the one thing, the only thing that's different right now is, is that uh, uh, the U.S. has got a lot of vaccine and Canada's got less. And so this is an opportunity for us to work together, uh, starting with essential workers. We're fortunate in North Dakota that over 50% of our residents over 18 and over have already received at least one dose of vaccine. And, and uh, North Dakota, is, uh, remarkably, we've administered over 500,000 doses in a state where our total population is less than uh, just the Winnipeg metro area, 762,000 people in the state of North Dakota. We've been named uh, and con are consistently in the among the top states uh, in as, as uh, ranked by the CDC in terms of our uh, percent of uh, doses administered for those we've received from the federal government. And with our supply increasing on a weekly basis, uh, and we've got an opportunity here where all citizens uh, 16 and over are eligible to receive vaccine. Uh, and we're starting to move from that place where instead of rationing vaccine, we're, we're marketing it. We have an opportunity as as Brian said, to uh, begin a plan to vaccinate as many as 4,000 Manitobans in the weeks ahead. Uh, we got a long history of, of, uh, of great relationship and collaboration, cooperation between North Dakota and Manitoba. And this is an opportunity to, to strengthen that bond by offering assistance to our, our, <clears throat> our Northern neighbor, which will help protect public health and help uh, get the flow of goods and services going again on both sides of the border. And, and so uh, we want to do our part to help those essential workers uh, from Canada who are frequently traveling through our state down I-29 across the United States to allow them to keep working and working safely. Uh, <clears throat> the timely and effective administration of vaccines is going to be a key part of, of uh, public health in the eventual and hopefully soon safe reopening of our shared uh, border between North Dakota and Canada. And I, the goal is the same. For the premier and myself, which is vaccinate as many people as possible, as quickly as possible with safe, effective vaccines so we can reopen our border and help our residents uh, and our trade and tourism return to normal. Canada, as I'm sure you know, is North Dakota's number one training partner in North Dakota export six billion to Canada in 2019. Uh, and, uh, and just on trucks, uh, Brian mentioned the number of border crossings uh, there by Pemina, but there is over 365,000 border crossings of trucks uh, into North Dakota uh, during the last full year, 16,000 more than that in, in uh, 2019. And we do share so many cultural and economic and familial ties uh, with our as neighbors across this border. We're grateful for the opportunity to collaborate on this life-saving effort. And again, uh, I wanna thank uh, Brian for his leadership. I wanna thank him for his friendship. I wanna thank him for his 
his ideas and is willing to push for new solutions. And uh, we're honored to be part of this first uh, first between our two nations of uh, to on, on vaccinating essential workers. And as Premier said, I hope we'll see more of this spreading across the Canadian border from coast to coast. Uh, so working together, we know that uh, we're going to emerge uh, stronger than ever. And again, uh, grateful to you, Ryan, and grateful to all of our friends and neighbors in Manitoba. Thank you. Thanks to you very much, Governor. And and again, the Governor is uh, taking time out of his busy schedule. He's in the midst of a of a state session right now. And so uh, we appreciate, Doug, you taking the time today. And on behalf of all Manitobans, I just want to say a sincere thank you to you personally and to your team uh, for your compassion, uh, for your consideration of our needs, and for the partnership, you know, for the relationship that we're building together. Our two jurisdictions are the gateway uh, to the Midwestern and Prairie prosperity we both are fighting for and, and for the opportunities for our people in the future. And so it's our shared goal uh, to preserve and protect all of us amidst this COVID pandemic. And it's my sincere thank you to you, Doug, as a person that I hope will lead to even greater accomplishments. We've got a number of projects that we've talked about that we want to push forward in the future. Look forward to doing that with you. In closing, just as we embark on this initiative together to uh, protect our communities and the border that we share, uh, I'd also like to ask Governor Burgum if you wouldn't mind joining me in officially signing our Memorandum of Understanding today. Very much look forward to that. I got my pen right here. Perfect. Thanks very much, Doug. And uh, thank you to you, Doug, and to all who've been part of this. And we'll be happy to take any questions that the journalists may have. We have a few here, Doug, some from uh, also from your side of the border, I'm told. Thank you, Mr. Premier. Thank you, Governor. We'll start our questions today. A reminder to reporters on the line, one question, one follow-up. We start with the Winnipeg Free Press and Larry. Oh, Larry Cooks of the Winnipeg Free Press. Uh, Governor Burgum, um, where will these clinics be set up? Will they be near all the, all the various border crossings? Uh, can you give us an idea of, of where they'll be set up? Uh, the initial pilot that we're going to launch uh, starting tomorrow is going to be at the uh, Alexander Henry uh, Safety Rest Area, which is near Drayton, North Dakota, which is just off of uh, I-29, uh, the Interstate 29, which cr crosses the border at Pemina, the very busy crossing that the Premier talked about. And, uh, and that's going to be very efficient for uh, northbound returning uh, essential workers drivers that are returning to Canada. Our, our thought is that this is going to be open on Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays. Uh, a lot of the drivers enter the U.S. on a Monday or Tuesday. They return on a Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So again, trying to pick a location and a time frame that's convenient. Uh, the hours, I think, are going to run from noon till 8 p.m. each day. Uh, we'll have nurses and EMT staff that are there to safely administer either the uh, Pfizer or Moderna uh, vaccine. And and then uh, we'll have EMTs and others there to do the 15 minute monitoring to make sure that no one's having an allergic reaction. So all standard safety protocols will be in place. Uh, and I think it's gonna be, uh, again, super convenient meeting people where they are uh, and getting the job done for our essential workers. My follow-up questions for Premier Pallister. Um, have you got any uh, stats, uh, Premier, on or any indications whether truck drivers, long haul truck drivers have higher COVID infection rates? I don't with me, Larry, but I can tell you that our truck drivers have been subjected to some pretty harsh treatment uh, along the routes, not blaming Americans solely for this. This has happened on both sides of the border. And I know that they're uh, vital and essential um, uh, to getting our goods to market and getting the services that we need back here, the goods we need back here to continue to operate. We're in a partnership economically and they're vitally important essential workers to us. And I know that uh, with the cooperation of our trucking association here and, and Governor Bergen's team, uh, that uh, those truck drivers will appreciate being able to be that much safer as they do their work. From Winnipeg, we go to Bismarck and KFRY, Jacob. Good morning, Governor and Premier. Governor, uh, the state has had a history of sharing 
different COVID supplies early on. There were uh, talks about giving supplies to or testing supplies to other states. I'm wondering if this program, you, you allured to it early on that this thing is expanding. Is North Dakota in talks with other states or other provinces about flying vaccines out there? Well, we did yesterday have a conversation with Premier Mo from Saskatchewan, who we also share a border with. Uh, he'd been intrigued. He'd heard the uh, the uh, early uh, uh, rumblings of this uh, partnership that we were forming with Premier Palliser in Manitoba. Uh, and uh, I know that uh, Manitoba and Saskatchewan share a, a really large border. Uh, but we also in the western part of the state have a lot of energy workers that are moving back and forth between uh, Saskatoon and Regina and the Bakken. Uh, and so uh, we're beginning discussions about a pilot project with Saskatoon uh, following the uh, the success of this uh, project that we're working with Manitoba. My follow-up, Governor, is uh, just we're still vaccinating a lot of people out here, wondering how you're so confident we'll have the supply for expanding programs like this with our neighbors. Well, thank you, Jacob. And uh, just before this at 10 o'clock, we had the weekly call with uh, all the governors uh, with the White House uh, Coronavirus Task Force. And again, uh, they're uh, announced again this week, even with uh, J&J still on pause, uh, over 17 and a half million doses of vaccine coming to the states. Uh, millions more beyond that going into the federal pharmacy program uh, and the federal vaccine sites. And so uh, we know uh, here in North Dakota and in other states around as we move from this uh, being rationing the vaccine to having to market the vaccine, we're going to very quickly in the next, in the weeks ahead of us, I think we're going to see excess supply building uh, on the U.S. side. And so this is the time to move uh, to start uh, working uh, closely with our neighbors because, again, uh, we're, we're so intertwined. The economies of Manitoba and North Dakota are completely intertwined. Uh, and this is a great time uh, with us to be uh, helping each other out. Up next from Global, Shane. Hi, thanks for taking my call. Um, I, I just wanted to confirm, uh, Mr. Governor, I think you said that the uh, shots that are going to be given are the Pfizer and the Moderna, but I just want to confirm that those are the two shots. And also just um, with the differences between uh, shots, you know, the J&J is being approved in, in the States and AstraZeneca approved here. I know uh, the United States has been giving Canada some AstraZeneca. I'm wondering if there's any plans to use other shots in the future. Uh, right now with the... Uh, uh, you know, J&J &J is on hold uh, or on a pause uh, through CDC review. They're going to have their final meeting on Friday. I'm optimistic that coming out of that, that there will be resuming the J&J. &J, but for the with the excess supplies that we've got right now, uh, it'll be Moderna and Pfizer will be used during this pilot. Great. Thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Premier, off topic, but I think it's important. Um, we're seeing numbers of the Chief Medical Examiner Office today that show uh, over death, overdose deaths up 87% in Manitoba last year. I'm just looking for your response to those numbers and then ask you if there's any plans uh, your government has to, uh, or what your government plans to do about the public health issue. Well, as you know, this, uh, this uh, COVID pandemic has added to the existing stresses that were already there in the lives of many, and it's... Uh, made mental health issues in the treatment and uh, care of those uh, who need that treatment and care uh, even more important priority. That's um, why we established with the first uh, province in Canada to establish a dedicated department to deal with the healing and addictions issues that are so critical. I know Governor Bergam and his wife have been very involved, by the way, in, in uh, addressing these issues south of the border, and we've talked about this. Um, We'll continue. We've had uh, a number of initiatives. We've committed significant new resources in this year's budget. Uh, and of course, we're going to continue to stay focused on, on the issues around addictions, around mental health as we move forward. Heading back over the border now, we go to Fargo and the Fargo Forum's Jeremy. Uh, Governor, we've seen the rate of vaccination in North Dakota slow in recent weeks, largely due to a lack of demand for the vaccine among younger residents. Um, you alluded to this earlier that the U.S. may switch from, um, you know, rationing the vaccine to marketing it, um, and this could be true in North Dakota as well. 
I'm wondering um, how this cross-border initiative could expand, what groups might be included in that? Well, I think the great place to start was with uh, really with Brian's idea around essential workers and those that as part of their their uh, roles are crossing the border regularly. Uh, but I, I think we want to continue to uh, look and and the Premier and I are committed as a follow up this to look for additional ideas of where we may be able to expand it. I think on the home front, uh, one of the things that we're working with, and I know uh, from just coming off that, that national governor's call, uh, is that across the nation as colleges are, uh, are wrapping up in the next three to four weeks and those students are heading back home across the country, uh, I know that uh, across the nation there's a big effort in terms of uh, uh, again, meeting people where they are, making it easy uh, for people, whether it's in rural areas, low income areas, uh, tribal areas, uh, college campuses, but just making it very easy for people to uh, who who may not have uh, hesitancy about the vaccine, but just with their lives being busy, haven't had the time, or maybe they thought they had to make an appointment. So with more, uh, you know, more convenient, more walk up, uh, more accessibility, more points where we can deliver it, like here again, uh, you know, doing this uh, at a at a rest area when people are on their regular route. I mean, I think it's part of the innovation here, which is again, uh, if you're driving a, uh, you know, 80 foot long semi truck or double trailers, you know, maybe and you've got long shifts and working, you know, when do you have time to go get an appointment and get a shot? So I, and we're just, we're trying to take the uh, this idea of meeting people where they are, uh, bring it to all kinds of populations uh, so we can uh, protect uh, more and more, uh, more and more of our citizens and uh, break that chain of transmission. And I, when I, again, I just want to say again, we, you know, look up and take a look at what's happening in India right now uh, and other places in the world. We're so fortunate to have the vaccine here and have an opportunity to break the chain for us to not uh, get to community immunity uh, and to fall back into something like what India is experiencing right now, uh, which is mass chaos, shortage of oxygen, shorting of hospital beds, and uh, through a mass casualty event. That's you know something we can avoid here with just strong execution on vaccines. And then a slightly um, unrelated follow-up for either the governor or the premier. Um, I'm wondering what the threshold might be for reopening the border to non-essential travel. Is there a certain vaccination rate or rate of infection that you're both looking at? We both want the border open when it's safe. We both know the federal governments in either country have the hammer on making that decision. We both know that the more vaccines we can get in people's arms, the sooner the better. That'll increase the likelihood of reopening that border, and that's in the best interest of everybody. Agree with that. Thank and thank you for your questions, Jeremy. Thanks for being on the call today. And now we go to the Brandon Sun and Kim. Good morning. Um, this question is for the governor, um, sir. I was wondering what is the cost of the pilot program. Well, Kim, first of all, if you're from Brandon, I thought the question for sure would be for the premier. That's his neck of the woods. But uh, uh, the when uh, but the cost is, uh, as they said in the opening remarks, uh, the federal government's providing the vaccine uh, to the states for free because the federal government purchased all these Pfizer and Moderna shots. So they're provided to the states for free. Uh, our state is uh, picking up the cost of the nurses and the EMTs. Uh, and so we're, you know, happy to do that. Uh, we have received some federal funds to help on vaccination programs like this. So, so uh, again, free, uh, free to the essential workers, no cost to them whatsoever. Thank you. I have no further questions. Thank you. Up next, we go to CJOB and Skyler. Hi, Governor and Premier. Nice to hear from you guys again. Uh, Premier, I've got a couple of questions for you and uh, kind of following the same suit as Shane. They're a little off topic, but I believe they are important. Uh, obviously, a huge uh, federal budget unveiled yesterday, um, and it includes a, a massive child care program that the feds want jointly split between uh, Ottawa and the provinces. Uh, is Manitoba ready to put up its uh, end of the bargain on that, uh, and do you know what that number could be? Well, so you asked two great questions, and the second one's important before I answer the first one, isn't it? So we'll have to see the details of what they're proposing. We have trouble with the federal government here that doesn't want to partner effectively on providing health care, so I'm very hesitant to give a blank check to the federal government already on a pronouncement pre-election. 
Uh, we are going to be providing child care increasingly have added spots here and we, we believe that's very important in the years ahead. As our population ages out of the workforce, we're going to need to help more people get into the workforce who want to be there. Uh, but I, I've got to see the details from Ottawa before I'm going to give them any approval on that. If you don't care about health care, yesterday's budget was a great budget. And as a follow-up to that, Premier, uh, is there a timeline for that consultation with Ottawa? And do you think the province uh, can offer that $10 a day child care in the next five years? We're already offering the second uh, least costly child care in the country. Uh, we've committed to maintaining that. Our major issue, as is the case in a lot of Canada, is less the cost and more the availability. And so we've got wait, wait lines that uh, we're very concerned about. We want to see more families get child care. Ottawa's plan appears at this point to be making child care uh, cost less for those who can get it. But we'd like to see more child care for those who can't get child care. From the Winnipeg Sun, Scott. Hi, good morning to both of you. Um, I guess this well, it might be for either of you, but um, uh, in terms of second dose schedule, I'm looking at the, the release here. Um, what does the U.S. follow for that, or what are you guys in North Dakota following? Is it, is it three weeks? Uh, what is the plan uh, to get second doses into arms after that initial first dose? Well, Scott, I'll jump in on that, and I and for I want to make sure they got a clarification on my prior answer, which is uh, regarding the cost. But uh, I said there was federal funds available. But specifically, uh, FEMA, Federal Emergency Management, uh, is the one that's providing reimbursement uh, for the cost of the nurses and the EMTs. So there's for North Dakotans, they should know there's no North Dakota tax dollars going uh, towards this pilot project. We're using uh, FEMA reimbursement as part of the uh, emergency. Uh, in terms of the second doses, uh, uh, you've got uh, Pfizer and Moderna. One is a three-week second shot. The other is a four-week second shot. Uh, and depending on the shot that we're providing, uh, those essential workers that get the first shot will get a uh, notification of the window of time in which they should be returning for their second shot. And with many of these folks running regular routes uh, into the U.S., uh, we think it's, uh, again, in working with the Trucking Association uh, and working with the Premier uh, that we'll be able to effectively schedule uh, those second shots within that time window. Oh, great. Thanks for that. Um, and I guess the second question also for the Governor. Um, at, at last week, Alaska announced that they would start, I think it was June 1st, they're targeting um, giving vaccines to travelers coming into the the state uh, to boost their tourism industry. Um, is North Dakota thinking about that? And I understand there is the federal, uh, the border issues right now, but is North Dakota thinking about offering vaccines to travelers uh, if those border restrictions get uh, loosened, I suppose? We don't have, we haven't uh, contemplated that specifically, but we do have in, in uh, working with the, uh, the White House uh, coronavirus task force, which we briefed on this project. Uh, and we do have, of course, workers uh, that come to the Bakken that are working that may be from Oklahoma or Texas. Uh, we do have the uh, authority and the desire to vaccinate people who are working or in North Dakota, regardless of their uh, home state or home country of residence, uh, because if they're going to be here, they're working uh, we want them vaccinated, so we, we again, will continue to look for opportunities to vaccinate uh, anyone who is uh, coming to North Dakota, but we haven't, uh, we ha we haven't uh, got onto the tourism one yet, but that's an interest interesting thought uh, to think uh, three, four months from now when there may be a lot of surplus supply of uh, a vaccine. But uh, we have vaccinated a lot of folks from Montana, South Dakota, Minnesota, far away as Wisconsin early on. We had people driving to North Dakota when we had uh, when we were effectively doing vaccines uh, and other states were a little behind uh, and we uh, have had enough capacity to do that. So we'll uh, continue to look for ways to help get the, the country and the region and our neighbor to the north, uh, get us all the community immunity so we can get back to normal. From Radio Canada, Alexia. Hi, good morning to both of you. 
Um, Mr. Pallister, I was wondering why ask uh, Dakota to uh, help vaccinate our drivers? Can we uh, make those es essential workers a priority in our vaccination campaign? Yeah, we're doing everything we can with the vaccines we have. And uh, the fact of the matter is that the United States has more vaccines. And uh, so we're looking to have a partnership with the United States to provide this service to essential workers who travel frequently to North Dakota and on to other states as well. And uh, we think this is an intelligent uh, example of how we can partner together because we are partners. And when we work together, we do better. Thank you. Um, um, how will you decide if a trucker is eligible or not? I mean, you said for Manitoban truckers, but for example, if someone works as a truck driver with a, a work permit, would he be able to receive a vaccine? We're working with the Manitoba Trucking Association on the, the actual details of this, so that's a good question. Uh, we can pass on and get you the information from the Trucking Association on that question. From CBC Manitoba, Ian. Good morning, Premier. Um, this question is for you, and, and it's, real, it's a bit of a follow-up from the question that was just asked there. But is, is the vision that trucking companies themselves would be calling and making these arrangements? Are we asking individual drivers to do that? Is, is there a sense of what that may look like? Yeah, no, we're setting up a facility within the health uh, department to coordinate this. And uh, as I referenced uh, in my earlier comments, uh, the governor and I have already been chatting about the possibility of expanding upon this in future. Uh, we, we believe that the sooner that we can get vulnerable people the vaccines, the better. And so uh, we'll be looking to provide the coordination, working jointly with our partners in North Dakota, of course, uh, to uh, facilitate this happening safely. Thank you. Um on the overdose numbers, which were cited earlier, an 87% spike, um, which is obviously significant. We are the only province in Western Canada with no safe consumption sites. Will Manitoba commit to opening safe consumption sites and introduce a safe drug supply? There are many, many ways in which we are addressing this issue. We'll continue to do that. Um, I think that too often the debate goes to the wedge between those who think a safe consumption site is the right answer and those who disagree and want to work on other priorities. I think that rather we should continue to do as we've been doing. We've been investing more and more resources. We've been directing more and more of our skilled people. And we've established a, a department solely for the purpose of uh, working on wellness and healing. Um, and that was in January. Uh, this is now April. Uh, we're uh, motivated by these numbers, sadly, uh, to continue to focus on this uh, very important uh, issue and category of issues. It's a, a complex and obviously multidimensional challenge for all of us, and it's, we're not alone in having to face it. From the Canadian Press, Steve. Uh, good morning, Premier. Um, have you had any feedback from the federal government on this initiative? Do you anticipate running into any trouble um, because of the procurement uh, angle on it. Um, just clarify for me, Steve, what you mean by procurement angle. I'm not quite clear. I'm sorry. Well, you're, you're, you're striking a deal to get, um, to get shots for uh, truckers crossing the border with North Dakota. Um, this is sort of outside is what we've seen so far, which is the federal government doing all the procurement and assigning. Um, have you run it by the feds? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I've communicated that by letter, but I don't think this should be about who gets the credit. We're not trying to get credit. We're trying to get vaccines into people's arms. Okay, and um, a Quebec Superior Court uh, today upheld the bulk of Bill 21, the, uh, the ban on religious uh, garb in, in the public service. I know you've been outspoken on this uh, before. Um, I'd like your thoughts on the, the ruling today that upheld the bulk of that, uh, of that law. I'm 100% sure it will be appealed to the Supreme Court uh, where I think it will go down. And I don't support the idea of discrimination against people on the basis of uh, race, creed or colour. And I believe that the Charter is clear on that enough that I disagree with the Quebec uh, Court on the decision. 
from CTV, Jeff. Uh, Mr. Premier, you've uh, touched on it, and so has the governor, um, on expanding this in the future. So what other kinds of workers beyond truckers could we be talking about here? Well, the governor alluded to a couple of examples. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, very interested in exploring this further with the governor. Uh, look, we, we have a border between us. It shouldn't be a barrier between getting people vaccinated. And uh, the governor and I know that if the shoe was on the other foot, I would be the first guy to offer help to him. And he knows that 110%. So right now, we're the people who need help. God forbid, but in five years, there could be another pandemic and it'll be us offering help straight up to North Dakota. That's how it works with this government and that's how it works with Governor Burgum and his team. So we've got, for example, we've got military people in our province. I'll give you this as an example. Many of them. They have a vaccine rollout, but there are many people who are missing in that process. That might be another group. Our reservists, for example. And we know how important our military people have been to us in times of desperation. And in this pandemic, how important our, our folks have been going up to Pingasi, numerous other communities as well, uh, to assist. Uh, so if we can assist in getting vaccines sooner to um, uh, people who are providing important essential services to our province, uh, I think that's a wonderful thing. That's just one example we're exploring. I've, I've uh, um, had some conversation uh, with the commanding officer 17 wing already on this issue. Um, but it's premature because as has been alluded to, of course, in some instances, we would need the federal government to make sure they're not in the way in order to allow us to get these things done. And just, just back to, to Steve's first question, I think, and, and maybe Steve will correct me on this, I think it, you talked about, you know, getting credit for it. I, I guess, do you, are you able to do this deal? Like, can the Fed stop you with the way the procurement rules are over the vaccine? I think that's what Steve was asking, but Steve could correct me on that. Yeah, well, I, I, yeah I, think, I think that's what he's asking, and I think I've said what I wanted to say on that. I don't think it should be as important whether the federal government gets the credit or we get the credit or Doug gets the credit. Doug and I aren't doing this to get credit. We're doing this to get people vaccinated. We want to reopen our border. We want to reopen our economies. We want our people to get their lives back. That's the goal here. That's where all, we all should be after that. From CHVN, Taylor. Hi, good afternoon. Along the same lines, what politically did this take to range? Because we're talking about uh, health care with two different countries. Well, we're talking about two guys that like each other and have worked together well and, and uh, who think. And so, uh, you know, we have teams of people that work with us who do the same. And uh, I'm proud of the relationship that we have with North Dakota and with Doug and his team. And I, I think this is an example of how things should work between governments in, in uh, partnering nations. Like I said earlier, we don't, uh, I mean, we're competitive people. Let's not kid ourselves. Uh, Doug and I both come from that background too, sports people and business people. But not, not to the point of dismissing the idea that we can do things better together because we're both from team sports backgrounds. We both understand what a team can do. And right now, North Dakota and Manitoba just became, uh, you know, Team North America. And I hope we're an example to others to, to look at the same kinds of uh, creative ideas to solve this problem, because it's a problem worth solving. And you're partnering with another country to get vaccines from Manitobans. Uh, why did you feel this was a necessary move right now? Well, because we aren't making any of them ourselves. We've had to partner with people from all over the world to get vaccines. The federal government has uh, done its best. Uh, recently, the Prime Minister secured extra vaccines from the United States as well. Good for him. We're securing some via North Dakota for Manitobans. It's really similar. I mean, if you, you know, if you look at this holistically, basically the world's in this, we're all in this, and what we're doing our best to do here is get as many vaccines as possible to the people who want them and need them as soon as possible. Our final reporter this morning from CBC National, Cameron. Hi, Premier, uh, Governor. Um, this may seem like a simplistic question, but um, I, it, things always kind of go down their own little slippery slope of definition. In terms of how this is actually going to work, when the clinic is set up tomorrow and going forward, 
will someone actually need to roll up in a truck in order to get a vaccine? I guess what I'm getting at here, say a snowbird is coming back to Winnipeg from Phoenix and happens to be passing through um, that border crossing tomorrow, would they be eligible for a vaccine? Doug, you, you tackle that one. Pretty well, sure. At the, at the, the northbound Alexander, Alexander Henry rest area, uh, again, there is ample spacing for uh, tr- lots of trucks to be able to park there during the short time that they're, you say they're there for 20 minutes, uh, get registered, get a shot, get their 15 minute waiting period. So we know we've got a lot of space for people. Uh, I, I personally hadn't thought about the Snowbird uh, thought. And so uh, I guess that's one that our team will have to work through. Uh, uh, tomorrow, but as I said, we're uh, you know we've had a lot of North Dakotans that are snowbirds. Uh, they might have got their first shot in Arizona. They get their second shot when they're back in North Dakota. Uh, again, if there's ways that we can help out, and if we've got extra vaccine, I mean, we'd rather put it in somebody's arm than leave it on a shelf right now. Uh, but that's a, a detail that I guess uh, we'll have to work out. But thanks for thanks for uh, raising that. And it's snowing in Bismarck today, so maybe the snowbirds want to wait a little longer before they head north. Uh, snowing here too, Governor. I guess the other question, and maybe Premier Palace, because this, uh, this might fall with you. In terms of uh, documentation of this, um, when someone gets a shot in North Dakota, would they be given some sort of documentation, uh, I guess for lack of a better term, a, a vaccine passport or slip or something like that? And how would this, how is this being, will this be tracked back by Manitoba Health? Will Manitoba Health have a record of Canadians who are getting a shot down in the state? In, you know, to in order to work through follow up and all that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely, uh, Cameron. So uh, the people that are going to be vaccinated will be given verification they've been vaccinated. Manitoba Health will be aware of that. And as the governor alluded to uh, previously, there'll be a follow up vaccination administered at the appropriate time based on their manufacturer's recommendations down there. Uh, so it's a it's good news story, I think. Um, I'm being waved out to close, I guess. Here, I'll just say again, thank you. Uh, Doug, to you. Thank you to your team. Uh, I look forward to uh, to seeing you other than virtually. I look forward to the opportunity to shake your hand and say thank you. We appreciate it here in Manitoba. We appreciate your friendship, your partnership, your creativity, uh, and uh, we're very thankful. And we look forward to further expansion of this concept uh, uh, because it is an urgent pandemic situation uh, made more urgent, of course, by, as you know, the differential levels of vaccine availability on either side of the border. But we can't let that border become a barrier to our progress. So again, thanks to you, Governor, and thanks to your entire team. Thanks to all who have been part of this uh, little broadcast today. Thank you, Brian. Grateful for you and grateful for your leadership and your partnership. Thank you. Thanks, Doug.